Section 8 of An Account of Egypt by Herodotus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Account of Egypt by Herodotus. Section 8. After these things, they said this king went down alive to that place which by the Hellenes is called Hades, and there played at dice with Demeter, and in some throes he overcame her, and in others he was overcome by her. And he came back again, having as a gift from her a handkerchief of gold. And they told me that because of the going down of Rampsinatos, the Egyptians, after he came back, celebrated a feast, which I know of my own knowledge also that they still observe even to my time. But whether it is for this cause that they keep the feast, or for some other, I am not able to say. However, the priests weave a robe completely on the very day of the feast and forthwith they bind up the eyes of one of them with a fillet, and having led him with the robe to the way by which one goes to the temple of Demeter, they depart back again themselves. This priest, they say, with his eyes bound up, is led by two wolves to the temple of Demeter, which is distant from the city twenty furlongs, and then afterwards the wolves lead him back again from the temple to the same spot. Now as to the tales told by the Egyptians, any man may accept them to whom such things appear credible. As for me, it is to be understood throughout the whole of the history that I write by hearsay, that which is reported by the people in each place. The Egyptians say that Demeter and Dionysus are rulers of the world below, and the Egyptians are also the first who reported the doctrine that the soul of man is immortal, and that when the body dies the soul enters into another creature which chances then to be coming to the birth. And when it has gone the round of all the creatures of land and sea and of the air, it enters again into a human body as it comes to the birth, and that it makes this round in a period of three thousand years. This doctrine certain Hellenes adopted, some earlier and some later, as if it were of their own invention. And of these men I know the names, but I abstain from recording them. Down to the time when Rampsinatos was king, they told me there was in Egypt nothing but orderly rule, and Egypt prospered greatly. But after him Cheops became king over them, and brought them to every kind of evil, for he shut up all the temples, and having first kept them from sacrifices there, he then bade all the Egyptians to work for him. So some were appointed to draw stones from the stone quarries in the Arabian mountains to the Nile and others he ordered to receive the stones after they had been carried over the river in boats, and to draw them to those which are called the Libyan mountains. And they worked by a hundred thousand men at a time, for each three months continually. Of this oppression there passed ten years while the causeway was made by which they drew the stones, which causeway they built, and it is a work not much less, as it appears to me, than the pyramid for the length of it is five furlongs, and the breadth ten fathoms, and the height, where it is highest, eight fathoms, and it is made of stone, smooth and with figures carved upon it. For this they said the ten years were spent, and for the underground he caused to be made as sepulchral chambers for himself in an island, having conducted thither a channel from the Nile. For the making of the pyramid itself there passed a period of twenty years, and the pyramid is square, each side measuring eight hundred feet, and the height of it is the same. It is built of stone, smoothed and fitted together in the most perfect manner, not one of the stones being less than thirty feet in length. This pyramid was made after the manner of steps, which some called rows and others bases, and when they had first made it thus they raised the remaining stones with machines made of short pieces of timber raising them first from the ground to the first stage of the steps, and when the stone got up to this, it was placed upon another machine standing on the first stage, and so from this it was drawn to the second upon another machine. For as many as were the courses of the steps, so many machines there were also, or perhaps they transferred one and the same machine, made so as easily to be carried to each stage successively, in order that they might take up the stones for let it be told in both ways according as it is reported. However that may be, the highest parts of it were finished first, and afterwards they proceeded to finish that which came next to them, 
and lastly they finished the parts of it near the ground and the lowest ranges. On the pyramid it is declared in Egyptian writing how much was spent on radishes and onions and leeks for the workmen. And if I rightly remember that which the interpreter said in reading to me this inscription, a sum of one thousand six hundred talents of silver was spent. And if this is so, how much besides is likely to have been expended upon the iron with which they worked, and upon bread and clothing for the workmen, seeing that they were building the works for the time which has been mentioned, and were occupied for no small time besides, as I suppose, in the cutting and bringing of the stones, and in working at the excavation under the ground. Cheops, moreover, came, they said, to such a pitch of wickedness, that being in want of money, he caused his own daughter to sit in the stews, and ordered her to obtain from those who came a certain amount of money. How much it was, they did not tell me. And she not only obtained the sum appointed by her father, but also she formed a design for herself privately to leave behind her a memorial. And she requested each man who came in to give her one stone upon her building. And of these stones they told me the pyramid was built, which stands in front of the great pyramid in the middle of the three, each side being one hundred and fifty feet in length. This Cheops, the Egyptians said, reigned fifty years, and after he was dead his brother Kephron succeeded to the kingdom. This king followed the same manner of dealing as the other, both in all the rest and also in that he made a pyramid, not indeed attaining to the measurements of that which was built by the former, this I know, having myself also measured it, and moreover there are no underground chambers beneath, nor does a channel come from the Nile flowing to this one as to the other, in which the water coming through a conduit built for it, flows round an island within where they say that Cheops himself is laid. But for abasement he built the first course of Ethiopian stone of divers colours, and this pyramid he made forty feet lower than the other as regards size, building it close to the great pyramid. These stand both upon the same hill, which is about a hundred feet high. And Kephren, they said, reigned fifty and six years. Here then they reckoned one hundred and six years, during which they say that there was nothing but evil for the Egyptians and the temples were kept closed and not open during all that time. These kings the Egyptians, by reason of their hatred of them, are not very willing to name. Nay, they even call the pyramids after the name of Philetus the shepherd, who at that time pastured flocks in those regions. After him, they said, Machirinos became king over Egypt, who was the son of Cheops, and to him his father's deeds were displeasing, and he both opened the temples and gave liberty to the people, who were ground down to the last extremity of evil, to return to their own business and to their sacrifices. Also he gave decisions of their causes juster than those of all the other kings besides. In regard to this, then, they commend this king more than all the other kings who had arisen in Egypt before him, for he not only gave good decisions, but also when a man complained of the decision he gave him recompense from his own goods, and thus satisfied his desire. But while Machirinos was acting mercifully to his subjects and practising this conduct which has been said, calamities befell him, of which the first was this, namely that his daughter died, the only child whom he had in his house. And being above measure grieved by that which had befallen him, and desiring to bury his daughter in a manner more remarkable than others, he made a cow of wood, which he covered over with gold, and then within it he buried this daughter, who, as I said, had died. This cow was not covered up in the ground, but it might be seen even down to my own time in the city of Sais, placed within the royal palace in a chamber which was greatly adorned. And they offer incense of all kind before it every day, and each night a lamp burns beside it all through the night. Near this cow in another chamber stand images of the concubines of Machirinos, as the priests at Sais told me. For there are in fact colossal wooden statues in number about twenty, made with naked bodies, but who they are I am not able to say, except only that which is reported. Some, however, tell about this cow and the colossal statues the following tale, namely that Machirinos was enamoured of his own daughter, and afterwards ravished her. And upon this they say that the girl strangled herself for grief, and he buried her in this cow, and her mother cut off the hands of the maids who had betrayed the daughter to her father, Wherefore now the images of them have suffered that which the maids suffered in their life. In thus saying they speak idly, as it seems to me, especially in what they say about the hands of the statues, 
for as to this even we ourselves saw that their hands had dropped off from lapse of time, and they were to be seen still lying at their feet even down to my time. The cow is covered up with a crimson robe, except only the head and the neck, which are seen overlaid with gold very thickly, and between the horns there is the disk of the sun figured in gold. The cow is not standing up, but kneeling, and in size is equal to a large living cow. Every year it is carried forth from the chamber. At those times, I say, the Egyptians beat themselves, for that god whom I will not name, upon occasion of such a matter. At these times, I say, they also carry forth the cow to the light of day, for they say that she asked of her father Mykirinos, when she was dying, that she might look upon the sun once in the year. After the misfortune of his daughter, it happened, they said, secondly to this king, as follows. An oracle came to him from the city of Buto, saying that he was destined to live but six years more. In the seventh year to end his life, and he being indignant at it, sent to the oracle a reproach against the god, making complaint in reply that whereas his father and uncle, who had shut up the temples and had not only remembered the gods, but also had been destroyers of men, had lived for a long time, he himself who practiced piety was destined to end his life so soon. And from the oracle came a second message, which said that it was for this very cause that he was bringing his life to a swift close, for he had not done that which it was appointed for him to do, since it was destined that Egypt should suffer evils for a hundred and fifty years, and the two kings who had arisen before him had perceived this, but he had not. Mykirinos, having heard this, and considering that this sentence had passed upon him beyond recall, procured many lamps, and whenever night came on he lighted these and began to drink and take his pleasure, ceasing neither by day nor by night. And he went about to the fen country and to the woods, and wherever he heard there were the most suitable places of enjoyment. This he devised, having a mind to prove that the oracle spoke falsely, in order that he might have twelve years of life instead of six, the nights being turned into days. This king also left behind him a pyramid much smaller than that of his father, of a square shape and measuring on each side three hundred feet lacking twenty, built moreover of Ethiopian stone up to half the height. This pyramid, some of the Hellenes say, was built by the courtesan Rhodopis, not therein speaking rightly. And besides this it is evident to me that they who speak thus do not even know who Rhodopis was, for otherwise they would not have attributed to her the building of a pyramid like this, on which have been spent, so to speak, innumerable thousands of talents. Moreover, they do not know that Rhodopis flourished in the reign of King Amasis, and not in this king's reign. For Rhodopis lived very many years later than the kings who left behind them these pyramids. By descent she was of Thrace, and she was a slave of Ladman, the son of Hephaestopetus, a Samian, and a fellow slave of Esop, the maker of fables. For he too was once the slave of Ladman, as was proved especially by this fact, namely that when the people of Delphi repeatedly made proclamation in accordance with an oracle, to find some one who would take up the blood money for the death of Aesop, no one else appeared, but at length the grandson of Ladman, called Ladman also, took it up, and thus it showed that Aesop too was a slave of Ladman. As for Rhodopis, she came to Egypt brought by Xanthes the Samian, and having come thither to exercise her calling, she was redeemed from slavery for a great sum by a man of Mytilene, Caraxos, son of Scamandronimos, and brother of Sappho the lyric poet. Thus was Rhodopis set free, and she remained in Egypt and by her beauty won so much liking that she made a great gain of money, for one like Rhodopis, though not enough to suffice for the cost of such a pyramid as this. In truth there is no need to ascribe to her very great riches, considering that the tithe of her wealth may still be seen even to this time by any one who desires it. For Rhodopis wished to leave behind her a memorial of herself in Hellas, namely to cause a thing to be made such as happens not to have been thought of or dedicated in a temple by any besides, and to dedicate this at Delphi as a memorial of herself. Accordingly with the tithe of her wealth, she caused to be made spits of iron of size large enough to pierce a whole ox, and many in number, going as far therein as her tithe allowed her, and she sent them to Delphi 
These are even at the present time lying there heaped all together behind the altar where the Kians dedicated, and just opposite to the cell of the temple. Now at Necratus, as it happens, the courtesans are rather apt to win credit. For this woman first, about whom the story to which I refer is told, became so famous that all the Hellenes without exception came to know the name of Rhodopis, and then after her one whose name was Archidike became a subject of song all over Hellas, though she was less talked of than the other. As for Caraxos, when after redeeming Rhodopis he returned back to Mytilene, Sappho in an ode violently abused him. Of Rhodopis, then, I shall say no more. After Machirinos, the priest said Ascetus became king of Egypt, and he made for Hephaistos the temple gateway which is towards the sun rising, by far the most beautiful and the largest of the gateways. For while they all have figures carved upon them and innumerable ornaments of building besides, this has them very much more than the rest. In this king's reign they told me that as the circulation of money was very slow, a law was made for the Egyptians that a man might have that money lent to him which he needed, by offering as security the dead body of his father. And there was added moreover to this law another, namely that he who lent the money should have a claim also as to the whole of the sepulchral chamber belonging to him who received it, and that the man who offered that security should be subject to this penalty, if he refused to pay back the debt, namely, that neither the man himself should be allowed to have burial when he died, either in the family burial place or in any other, nor should he be allowed to bury any of his kinsmen whom he lost by death. This king, desiring to surpass the kings of Egypt who had arisen before him, left as a memorial of himself a pyramid which he made of bricks, and on it there is an inscription carved in stone and saying thus, Despise not me in comparison with the pyramids of stone, seeing that I excel them as much as Zeus excels the other gods. For with a pole they struck into the lake, and whatever of the mud attached itself to the pole, this they gathered up and made bricks, and in such manner they finished me. Such were the deeds which this king performed, and after him reigned a blind man of the city of Anesis, whose name was Anesis. In his reign the Ethiopians, and Sabacos, the king of the Ethiopians, marched upon Egypt with a great host of men. So this blind man departed, flying to the Fen country, and the Ethiopian was king over Egypt for fifty years, during which he performed deeds as follows. Whenever any man of the Egyptians committed any transgression, he would never put him to death, but he gave sentence upon each man according to the greatness of the wrongdoing, pointing them to work at throwing up an embankment before that city from whence each man came of those who committed wrong. Thus the cities were made higher still than before for they were embanked first by those who dug the channels in the reign of Sesostris, and then secondly in the reign of the Ethiopian, and thus they were made very high. And while other cities in Egypt also stood high, I think in the town at Bubastis especially the earth was piled up. In this city there is a temple very well worthy of mention, for though there are other temples which are larger and built with more cost, none more than this is a pleasure to the eyes. Now Bubastis in the Hellenic tongue is Artemis, and her temple is ordered thus, except the entrance it is completely surrounded by water, for channels come in from the Nile not joining one another, but each extending as far as the entrance of the temple, one flowing round on the one side, and the other on the other side, each a hundred feet broad and shaded over with trees, and the gateway has a height of ten fathoms, and it is adorned with figures six cubits high very noteworthy. This temple is in the middle of the city and is looked down upon from all sides as one goes round. For since the city has been banked up to a height while the temple has not been moved from the place where it was at the first built, it is possible to look down into it and round it runs a stone wall with figures carved upon it, while within it there is a grove of very large trees planted round a large temple house, within which is the image of the goddess, and the breadth and length of the temple is a furlong every way. Opposite the entrance there is a road paved with stone for about three furlongs, which leads through the market-place towards the east, with a breadth of about four hundred feet, and on this side and on that grow trees of height reaching to heaven, and the road leads to the temple of Hermes. This temple, then, is thus ordered. The final deliverance from the Ethiopian came about, they said, as follows. 
he fled away because he had seen in his sleep a vision in which it seemed to him that a man came and stood by him and counseled him to gather together all the priests in egypt and cut them asunder in the midst having seen this dream he said that it seemed to him that the gods were foreshowing him this to furnish an occasion against him in order that he might do an impious deed with respect to religion and so receive some evil either from the gods or from men he would not however do so but in truth he said the time had expired during which it had been prophesied to him that he should rule egypt before he departed thence for when he was in ethiopia the oracles which the ethiopians consulted told him that it was fated for him to rule egypt fifty years since then this time was now expiring and the vision of the dream also disturbed him sabacos departed out of egypt of his own free will then when the ethiopian had gone away out of egypt the blind man came back from the fen country and began to rule again having lived there during fifty years upon an island which he had made by heaping up ashes and earth for whenever any of the egyptians visited him bringing food according as it had been appointed to them severally to do without the knowledge of the ethiopian he bade them bring also some ashes for their gift this island none was able to find before Amartios. That is, for more than seven hundred years the kings who arose before Amatyros were not able to find it. Now the name of this island is Elbo, and its size is ten furlongs each way. End of section eight. Recording by Philip Gould.